Hello, my name is Mark Haber and I am a Clinical Associate Professor at the University of Wollongong as well as a Senior Lecturer at the University of Macquarie University Hospital and a Shoulder Surgeon. I work in a number of practices around Sydney. In this presentation I am going to talk about adhesive capsulitis commonly known as a frozen shoulder. A frozen shoulder is a perplexing condition. The first question you probably have is, what is it? And if you are affected by this condition, you must be thinking, why me? The third question you would be asking is, how do you know that this is what I have? And how does it affect me? The final question is, what can be done? I hope to answer all these questions through this presentation. So, on to the first question. What is a frozen shoulder? The current consensus definition by the American Shoulder Elbow Society is a condition of uncertain cause characterized by significant restriction of both active and passive shoulder motion that incurs in the absence of a known intrinsic disorder. And what they mean by occurs in the absence of a known intrinsic shoulder disorder is that there is no underlying disease of the shoulder explaining the stiffness and pain. But the term a frozen shoulder can end up being a waste can diagnosis and is often overused and misapplied to people with a stiff and painful shoulder for any cause, such as arthritis. So, as there is no underlying known disorder, a frozen shoulder remains poorly understood despite many attempts to explore the underlying cause. We therefore classify frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis into a primary or secondary frozen shoulder. The primary frozen shoulder has no significant findings on history or investigations to explain the stiffness and pain. Whereas a secondary frozen shoulder, there is a known extrinsic cause such as an injury, for example fracture, or systemic disorders such as diabetes or thyroid disease, either over or active. The next question you may be asking is why me? Well, shoulder pain is very common, indeed is the third most common cause of musculoskeletal pain after low back pain and neck pain. And frozen shoulder is a very common cause of shoulder pain and indeed affects 2% of the general population, 11% of diabetics get a frozen shoulder and indeed type 1 diabetics who are insulin dependent have a 40% chance of developing a frozen shoulder. However most people who develop a frozen shoulder are not diabetic at all. And there's a 15% chance it'll affect both shoulders either simultaneously that is at the same time or sequentially, usually within five years of the disease onset from the first shoulder. However, interestingly, recurrence in the same shoulder is extremely unusual. Women are affected more frequently by men with a female to male ratio of three to two, so it is not particularly dramatic. Menopause was thought to be a cause of frozen shoulder in women, However, it is realised that it, that is coincidental. It is mainly an age-related factor. Frozen shoulder appears to affect people almost exclusively between the ages of 50 and 60. Some people get it in their late 40s, but is actually extremely rare in people in, at 60 or over. And it does affect women slightly younger than men with an average age of onset in women of 52 years old and 55 years for men. 
there does appear also to be a genetic predisposition to this condition. So what is the cause? Well it is essentially unknown and it is indeed a per curious and perplexing problem. One clue is that it is more common in diabetics, people with over or underactive thyroid and also people with raised triglycerides. The question is what is making your shoulder so sore? This is thought to be an inflammatory cascade associated with an abnormal cytokine production. So it is as if something has caused, called the cavalry to repair a, an inj the injured shoulder. The inflammatory cascade calls upon cells in the bloodstream to accumulate in the shoulder. So hormones stimulate cells circulating the blood system to enter the shoulder capsule. And it's like dominoes. Something triggers this process and it doesn't seem to matter what flicked the first domino, what triggered this process. It keeps on going at its own determined rate until eventually all the dominoes run out. So what is an inflammatory cascade? Well, it is a cascade of chemical and cell reactions which are driven by abnormal cytokine production. Cytokines are like hormones. And these hormones cause abnormal tissue scarring by fibroblasts, which are cells that come out of the bloodstream to enter the joint capsule. These hormones, or cytokines, attach themselves to the cells called fibroblasts. And there are two types of fibroblasts. There are the normal fibroblasts, which lay down collagen or scar tissue. And there are the myofibroblasts, fibroblasts with a bit of muscle in them, which can shrink stretched or torn tissues. And when these are stimulated, they retract, make the injured tissues shrink down. Ideally, for a scar, for example, in your skin, which has to heal over. And once these myofibroblasts have shrunk down the injured tissues, the fibroblasts can lay down the scar tissue to mend the torn. This inflammatory and healing appears to occur in both the lining synovium and the underlying capsule and ligaments of the shoulder joint. The synovium becomes extremely inflamed. Cytokines um, occur within the capsule and this is associated with increased blood supply. The cytokines stimulate the, the cells as we discussed to appear in the inflamed capsule and the cells, the fibroblasts, then do their work in the capsule of the shoulder joint. So the capsule ends up being shorter and thicker. It's interesting that fluid aspirated from shoulders of patients with a frozen shoulder have been shown to stimulate fibroblast growth in the laboratory. So the next question is, how do you know this is what I have? When it comes to performing tests and x-rays, we think of the philosophy, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and walks like a duck, it must be a duck. And it's only when it behaves abnormally do we feel we have to perform a number of investigations. So if it doesn't look like a duck, we may test for thyroid, cholesterol, fasting blood sugars looking at for diabetes, and especially in bilateral cases when it affects both shoulders at the same time, and people younger than the age of 45. The clinical diagnosis 
does not require confirmation with imaging such as x-ray and ultrasound. It does not usually provide any further information except for ruling out other conditions such as arthritis. So x-rays, ultrasounds and even MRIs are usually completely normal in a primary frozen shoulder. Arthrogram is the only investigation which confirmed the diagnosis and this is performed when a needle is placed into the shoulder joint and is injected with a dye. We can see a normal MRI of the shoulder joint. When dye is injected it pulls in the lower part of the shoulder capsule. Well your next question is how does a frozen shoulder affect me? Typically there is a gradual onset of pain which appears to worsen over six months and as the pain becomes more severe the movement deteriorates. With worsening pain and reducing movement we call this the freezing phase of a frozen shoulder and it's a time of much concern. At its worst with severe pain and restricted movement we call this the frozen phase. When things start to resolve we call this the thawing phase. It's like a locomotive full of fuel. It just gets worse and worse and worse until the fuel runs out and then it gradually peters off. It doesn't have mad fluctuations like other conditions such as arthritis. The whole condition lasts on average 30 months which, which is just over two years. But typically the worst of the frozen shoulder is at six months. By 12 months things are often well on the improve and by 18 months most symptoms have resolved but as stated it's about 30 months before the condition has largely resolved. Interestingly a long-term outcome study of frozen shoulder performed by Dr. Hand in 2008 looked at people four and a half years on average after onset of their condition. He showed that at four and a half years 60% of people had a near normal sorry or near normal shoulder while 40% of people still had some ongoing symptoms. Of that 40% 5% still had severe problems the 95% were mild. So there seems to be a fair range in how this condition affects people from fairly mild to terribly severe still very symptomatic at four years and it appears to be at about five percent of people who are still severely affected at four years. And he showed that those with the most severe symptoms at the condition onset had the worst long-term outcome. The next question you may be asking is what can be done about my frozen shoulder? First of all we have to appreciate the natural history of this condition. What we mean by the natural history is what would happen if we did nothing. Maybe shorter than typical, maybe milder than typical and often you have to adopt a bit of a wait and see approach to see which way it's going to go. Treatment options I will discuss include physiotherapy, cortisone injections and arthroscopic release. Physiotherapy when performed in the acute or freezing phase of the shoulder joint tend to make things worse. However, when performed later they can reduce the stiffness. Cortisone injections do provide good short-term relief of the pain and this may eliminate the worst of the pain. If the cortisone wears off and the pain recurs, a second injection can be performed. It is rare that we need to perform more than two injections to save you the worst, the peak 
of the pain of a frozen shoulder. If these, condition, if these treatment options don't help, we consider an arthroscopic release. And this can dramatically reduce your pain and restore your movement within weeks. So how do we treat a frozen shoulder? Sometimes we just try a cortisone injection either into the subacromial bursa or the glenohumeral joint. If the bursal injection helps, it's not a frozen shoulder, it's a bursitis. But with whichever injection does help, this can be repeated if necessary. And as I mentioned, in a, in a frozen shoulder, often we only have to repeat the injection once. If things settle, no further intervention is required. However, if six months pass by and you are still very painful and stiff, we can consider the procedure of an arthroscopic release and I will discuss this in a further video. Well I'd like to thank you very much for listening to my talk on a frozen shoulder and further information can be found on my website at so.com.au